I'm Shannon, and uh, we're here today with one of my very, I don't want to call them favorites, um, I have a lot of animals that I work with as educator here at the zoo, uh, but this is Tiki, and Tiki is one of the very special animals that we have here at the zoo. She is a ball python. Um, she lives here next door to her twins, well, her clutch mate, can't call them twins. Um, her clutch mate, um, Tiki, no, oh, sorry, Rondé, sorry, this is Tiki, that's Rondé, I got confused. Um, the great thing about these guys is that, I just think it's so neat, that they are actually the oldest animals in the zoo. Uh, we think about some of those animals that live a long, long time being the older animals here, and some of that's true, but these guys, these two ladies, are the oldest animals in the zoo. They're 38 this year. So I know some of the questions are going to be, what is the lifespan of a ball python? Well, somewhere between 30 and 40 is very typical. Um, so they're getting very close to that top range, but they're in great health, really good condition, really good health, really great attitudes. So ball pythons, they come from Africa. They're from the rainforest of Western and Central Africa, just above the equator. If you look on the map, you want to do some geography today with the kiddos. Check out the map and look at those countries that are Western, Central Africa, and you're gonna find the places where ball pythons have come from. So if you check out the markings, that's what I love about these guys. They have terrific markings. Um, in fact, some people call them ET snakes. Now, Rondes are better than hers are, gotta say. But if you look at the markings that they have, this is one that's pretty decent. It looks kind of like ET's head with the eyes and the shape of the head. They're also called royal pythons. That's the name that was given to them because actually some of the royal family um, in the areas where they come from would wear them as bracelets, like I'm doing right now. They'd wear them as jewelry, put them around their, um, their arms, uh, maybe, their, maybe their necks, which is not a wise thing actually to do, but they make beautiful jewelry. Um, part of the reason that they could do that is just simply the temperament of these things. They're really docile, they're very chill. Um, they have just an easy going temperament where they relax, they just are interested in and very curious in a lot of different things. So that makes them very, very um, useful for program animals. They're really wonderful, they love to be involved. And so she's just kind of chilling but exploring. You can see her head's going here and there and everywhere, smelling what's been on her shirt. And I know she wants a walk. Well, we use that term loosely. But we're going to put her down here on the floor. I'll unwrap my hand. She gets a little, a little excited and wraps around so that I can, uh, I can do some work getting her off. But here she goes. I love watching snakes move on the ground. Without legs, it's incredible how strong they are. We have to um, understand that there's bones in there, lots and lots of bones. They only have a few types of bones that they've got a skull. They've got a lower jaw. They have vertebrae up the back, so that's their spine, and then they have ribs. And that's really it. Obviously no leg bones, no feet bones, anything like that. Um, and the rest is organs and muscle. You can see by the size, by the, the girth of her, that she is very strong. These guys are very, very strong. Um, they only grow up to be about four feet long, and that's roughly what she is, um, average size. There's so many cool things to know about snakes. And I know we talked about a snake a couple weeks ago, but some of you uh, might be new watching today and have some cool questions about a ball python for us. So I want to make sure you get a chance to ask those, too. Uh, I got a question, but first I want to say that Kennedy, who's five, says, I like your snake. Oh, thank you, Kennedy. I'm so glad that you love her. She's, she is a really sweet girl. And a lot of our, our guests, our, uh, our friends, the zoo friends, have met her in person. She's been here at the zoo since 2005, so she's had a lot of time to get to know everyone. She's one of our Master JZK's favorite animals to take out for our chats at the Rainforest Theater to meet folks. So um, you, a lot of you probably met her or there will be the chance at some point to be able to meet her again. 
And you said she's about four feet long, right? She's about four feet yeah. long. Um, Grace's mom is watching as usual, and she wants to know the difference between um, a ball python and a reticulated python. and just blow it up, <laughs> ginormous, uh, to, well, in our case, um, 19 feet or so, uh, ball python, or uh, reticulated python, that's basically what's gonna happen. Um, they're very, very similar. Um, they obviously are gonna eat similar things in, in that they're carnivores. Um, these guys are gonna eat smaller prey than a reticulated python, obviously. Uh, but their structure is really very, very similar. And even their activity is very similar. They're both um, primarily ground dwelling, although snakes are great climbers. With the, the muscles they have, the strength they have, climbing is easy, so they, they will do that. But you can tell um, the reticulated python and the ball python have that dark coloration. They're, they're really modeled uh, with the dark and light colors, which is great camouflage on a forest floor. So if you think about a rainforest and put them in the, on the ground, with the leaf litter and the branches and all those things that they can hide in, it's going to just match. So they're going to be very difficult to find. And even if they're climbing up into the understory on the lower branches, they're going to be difficult to see. Um, so that type of coloration is really useful for the pythons that live in a forest area. So you'll even see that similarity between the two. Yeah. And pythons are, are actually very, very closely related to boas as well. So we have, um, it, and honestly, it's a lot of it's the differentiation is, is simply by geography. So you're going to find pythons in the old world, which would be the eastern hemisphere. You're going to find, and that's a, that's primarily, and you're going to find boas, or it's the so snake's name, boas, over in the, uh, the western hemisphere, north and south America. All right. Yeah, so these are African, these ball pythons are African, and then the reticulated are Asian. Right, right. Uh, so that's another yeah. difference. But yeah, we, had, we used to have a green tree python right. here, which Asian. Which, and they are completely green, and they live in the trees. Yep, so, so it, that is a difference in camouflage. Yeah, there's just a ton of different types, and they have all, all sorts of different niches and things like that. Uh, Grace's dad wants to know how much he, she weighs, and I think she's about five pounds. I, yeah, that's I think right. she's about two and a half kilos, which um, is about five pounds, um, which is, I mean, she's pretty strong. Oh, very when strong. When she curls around your wrist. Yeah, she can cut the circulation off to my hands, um, which, let's go ahead and talk about it. Why is it, I kind of mentioned it earlier, why is it not safe to put a snake around your neck? Well, um, because they're solid muscle. And if she's around my arm or even around my waist, I have some I have some good strength and leverage that I can take her off. I can unbuckle her from my waist or I can unwrap her from my arm more easily than pushing up with your hands or trying to work from a, an, a, an elevated place. You have less strength. Um, it's just in general kind of a thing. And the python or the snake is generally going to be stronger than than we are if she and, and and she's not going to ever hold on because she's i can't say ever but she's not tending to hold on because she wants to hurt us at all um it would be fear a fear response is to just clinch and we know how that's like right have you ever been maybe watched a movie you're going through a haunted house or some other fun halloween thing um and you just the farther you go you just you're going you're going you're going you're getting more nervous more scared and then at the end you realize how tightly clenched you are <laughs> and your muscles are so tight well that's just the fear response and they can get that too so if I were to have her around my neck and a, a big truck would go by and there would be a, a loud a, she can't hear the noise but the vibration would hit her and she'd be like what is that and she just clenched around my neck now I can't breathe and uh, my, my hands could still, I could still breathe and try to get her off my hand if that were the case, if she were on my arm. So 
It's just really not a safe practice to put snakes around your neck in general. We just never do that at the zoo. Uh, Charlie, he's, he, I assume it's he, Charlie, he or she, um, is six and wants to know her name again. Oh, wanna... hi, Charlie. This is Tiki, T-I-K-I. -I. Her sister's name is Rondé. Um, we got these guys from, they arrived from another zoo where they had been programmed animals and had gotten a great start in life. But they came with kind of silly dull names that we weren't really crazy about. So we wanted to go ahead and rename them. And thinking that they were ball pythons, and that's B-A-L-L, -L, not B-A-L-D. Yeah, they're bald. We can see them. But ball python is what their name is. And um, thinking about that name and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that they're both clutch mates. They're almost like twins. We decided that we would name them after the, the Barber twins of pro football fame. So Tiki and Rondé Barber are their namesakes. Uh, she, they are whichever way you want to go with that direction wise. But that's where we got the idea. Um, they're called ball pythons because when, like all snakes, when they are sensing fear, they will coil up. Um, snakes just want to be small when they are in a, in a place where they feel threatened or fearful. So they're gonna, they're gonna constrict up, they're gonna be in a, a tight little ball. But these guys can be in a very tight ball. They can just completely mash themselves up and then they'll put their head right in the middle of that of that ball that they've made. Let's move around a little bit so she stays in our zone. There we go. She's all about the explore. And that's why they call ball pythons because they will just appear like as a ball when they're threatened. We have two similar questions. Uh from William and Ricky. Um, how long does it take to reach full size and then do they continue to grow until they die? That's a great question. Um, generally a snake this, this size, when they get to be, I would say 10 is usually when they get to be their, really their max size roughly. Um, and it is true that they never stop growing. With reptiles, that just is the case. They, they have a, an adult size, but they don't actually have a maximum, true maximum size. Um, now, when they get to be adult size, they're not gonna continue to grow great lengths. Um, it's just not gonna happen. So if we were to, um, if Eric were to feed her extra food, she's hungry, she wants to eat, then um, as an adult snake, she could grow an extra, inch a year maybe then go into millimeters <laughs> um, it's really not not too much of a difference but technically they still can grow it just depends on the amount of food that they yeah. eat a lot of people think it's about space it's definitely not about space if you keep her in a small tank she will not stay small she's going to she's going to be that four foot long snake that you see here no matter what size her tank is so we have to make sure that her home is is adequate and, and adequately sized for, for how big we know they're going to get. That's, that's one of those misconceptions about reptiles that people, people have. Right. And if we keep feeding her and keep feeding her, she might grow a little bit in length, yeah. but she's definitely going to get fat. That's right. <laughs> and um, they're going to just, they're going to be a ball python in a different sense because they'll be pretty round. Uh, Kelly yes. wants to know what they eat. Ah, uh, well. These guys are fed rats. Um, how many rats do they get in their feeding? I give these two, because they're full grown and we don't, they've been overweight in the past, I give them one medium sized rat every three weeks right now. Okay, very good. Well, snake, it's nice to have the, the food guy right here to answer our questions <laughs> about it, what they're eating right now. Um, they, this kind of snake is all about the, the furry and the feathery. They like to find food that's got some heat in it. So the, the warmth of those bodies, um, those endothermic animals, you might've heard of warm blooded endothermic is the scientific term. And um, they're gonna, they, they find that, that heat and that's where they, what they wanna eat. So smaller animals that are furry birds, they, would, they wanna eat that stuff. That's, that's their primary food source out in the wild. So here at the zoo, a rat will replicate that really nicely. Um, 
and they only eat every three weeks, and, and snakes in general don't, don't need to eat very often. Reptiles, um, depending on what kind they are, don't always need to eat very often. And the reason for that really is that they don't create their own body heat. They're not endothermic. They're what we call exothermic or ectothermic, and that means that they get their heat from their surroundings. They don't control their own body temperature internally. They have to be in a warm place to be warm and a cool place to be cool. So she is right now, her internal temperature is the same as the air around her. So it's about 72 degrees in this building. So that's her body temperature. Um, because they don't create their own body heat, they don't use as many calories. Most of the food that we eat goes straight into making our, our internal temperature what it is, keeping it at 98 degrees. So 70 to 80% of what we eat does that. So if you think about taking away 70 or 80% of what we eat, that's what reptiles really need to consume, especially if they're carnivores. That, that is good, um, good energy that they're eating. It's not wasteful energy. So um, they don't need to eat as often, simply put. They only need enough food to get calories to move around, to get energy for moving around and for their organs to be working and for growth. So they just don't need to eat as often. Uh, Charlie and April, they've been watching a lot and asking a ton of great questions. They're wondering how many pythons we have at the zoo. Oh, well, let's see. We, I, we just have the three pythons at the zoo. We have she and her sister, Rhonda, Tiki and Rhonda, and then we have the reticulated python. Um, oh, and we do the Timor. The Timor, yeah. We have, the so we have, we have four pythons right now. Currently, Timor, yeah. he's so cool. He just looks completely different than these guys. He's not got spots. He's just got more of a solid color, mm -hmm. but he's very shimmery, and uh, he's cool. Yeah. He's a really good guy. The Timor we had out when we did the reticulated python. Oh, uh, nice. Uh, video that was a long time ago but that's on our YouTube channel and then way back in our Facebook page cool. so all of these talks that we've done all the talks that Shannon's done are still they're on our YouTube page on our YouTube channel and then they're on our Facebook page so you can always go back um, Bryson who's 11 missed the beginning he asked if we can hold it oh well we can yeah absolutely and she really likes to um to feel our skin, feel our clothes, she gets really into that. Textures are a big deal for snakes. It's one of their great enrichments is textures. That's what she's been doing with the carpet, kind of tickling her belly on it. Um, but she, yes, she's very docile. She's one of our program animals, so we take her lots of places, um, introduce her to lots of different people. She loves a back rub. Gets really excited when she gets to come out. And then Bryson Austin wants to know how often they molt. Oh, what a good question. Well, that's I was hoping to introduce you to both of our ball pythons today, but her sister, Rhonda, is getting ready to shed, so um, she doesn't want to be handled right now. Um, these guys, they shed their scales um, three to four times a year, so every three to four months is when they're going to shed. Um, she just did, Tiki just did, so she's got fresh scales on. When they're young, they're shedding um, as they grow because the scales that grow out of their skin do not, they don't grow with them. It's just like us in our clothes. So when you grow out of your clothes, you have to give this to somebody else and get some new ones, right? So uh, the same thing happens with these guys, except they don't go to the mall or the thrift store. They just have to make their own clothes. Um, they, they shed those, uh, those old scales that don't fit and grow new ones that do. And then once they're adult size, they really are only shedding in order to clean themselves because they don't have any other way to really clean themselves. They, have, they get um, parasites or fungus, bacteria growing in between their scales and, and that can be harmful to them. They also just wear out. You can see how she's rubbing her scales on whatever she's, where she's moving. So in the wild especially, it's just going to be a lot of friction and um, that's going to that's going to wear those scales out and won't be as protective. So she needs to shed those and get a new set. So as an adult, it's just not as often, but yeah, she still does it. Uh, Mary Beth is wondering, how do they hear and where are their ears? Ooh, good questions. Well, they have no ears. So that's an easy answer. And that's kind of weird, right? She can sort of hear what, what we're doing. 
It's not like our hearing, though. She can't hear words. She can't hear enunciations. She doesn't really know her name. Um, she can't. She just can't hear it. What she does, though, is feels vibrations in the air and in the ground. So you can see how snakes, their whole body is on the ground, including their chin. They have these little bones that are inside their head that kind of rattle around. And I don't know, if, you, if you're familiar with a tuning fork, it sounds a little like that. So maybe um, if, you, if you don't happen to have a tuning fork at home, which most people don't, I'm sure that you can find a video on that that will, that will let you hear that sound. And it will, it's kind of a ring, ringing sound. But it can have different pitches, different levels, different intensities, and that's what the snakes will listen for. So as the ground, it, it, as there's vibration in the ground, it'll make those, those sounds, those ringing sounds um, to her. And she can uh, sense whether it's something large coming, whether it's something small coming. And at, at some point, they actually do learn, oh, that's what that food that I like to eat sounds like when it comes. <laughs> and this is what that predator I've been trying to avoid sounds like when it's coming. Um, so they can hear, they can hear, hear sounds that way. They feel the vibration in the air and in the ground. It's kind of a simple way to explain that. It's much more complicated than that, unfortunately. All right. I think we have one last question from Kelsa. She says, do they have a lot of health issues? Well, honestly, no. Um, and our girls, our girls really don't. Tiki is a very, very healthy snake. Um, Rhonda went through some respiratory issues several years ago now, but she came out just fine. She didn't get pneumonia, I believe it was, and she had, um, you know, some medication that she had to do and that sort of thing, and it was, it, she came out fine. So, um, they are, they can get that kind of, a, of an illness. Um, <clears throat> but in general, I mean, snakes don't have those uh, specific types of illnesses or, or medical issues that, that some animals might get. You know, they're not really prone to cancers, they're not prone to certain conditions. So that's a good thing for snakes. And Tiki here is, is a very healthy girl. Yeah. I think if you're talking about from a pet standpoint, just making sure you get your snake from a, a good breeder. Uh, reputable um, breeders are so important. Yeah, you can go to a, a pet show and they'll have containers upon containers of snakes or other animals, and some of those people are less concerned with how healthy the animal is and more about making money. So just, if you really want something like this, make sure you look around and find uh, somebody you trust that, that other people trust as well, and you're more likely to get a good healthy animal that'll live 40 years. Right, and it's important too to know their, their nutritional needs or dietary needs. We do have to give, we do give them supplements, calcium supplement, and, um, and that sort of thing, so that they're able to, we can, we can make sure that they're getting that nutrition that they need, that they're, they might be missing from the wild. All right, um, we're gonna wrap up. Um, remember to, um, if you would like to have a chance to win that painting by our mystery animal, um, just make any sort of donation at all to the donate button. It was not me. No, I think it's more, I, it's more artistic ability than I have. So it definitely wasn't me. And then uh, I mentioned our YouTube channel earlier. If you go to our YouTube channel, we've got our chicken cam up. Those chicks we hatched out last week are on the chick cam 24 hours a day. You can watch them. It's very therapeutic. So you can go there. And we'll be back next week. Yeah. Shannon will be back yeah. next week. Yeah. Thanks, guys.